Hi YouTubers, hi I'm back with a 41 Years of Mills and Boone and I thought as I'm going to, this is the first ever book, the 41 Years of Mills and Boone, I've got to go out with some style. Okay, so um, as similar to a review coming up, which I literally go into a Mills and Boone chapter by chapter and just rip it apart, this I'm going to do a 10 chapter review. Okay, if I do chapter by chapter, it'll take me way too long because this is a doorstep of a Mills and Boone novel, A Heart for Compass by Sarah Ferguson, Duchess of York. Okay, so this has been in the press. Um, I did really didn't know much about it. I know it's based on one of our ancestors. It's been in the papers, but hey, here we go. Okay, okay. So here we go. Read the blurb. London, eighteen sixty-five. If I were hurt, sorry, once again. Three, two, one. Well hi YouTubers, hi I'm back with 41 Years of Mills and Boone and I thought this is the last ever one I'll be uploading for the 41 Years of Mills and Boone so I thought as I'm going to go out, it's going to go out some style I got A Heart for Compass by Sarah Ferguson, Duchess of York Okay, this has been in the press so I thought I'd give it a shot so hey, let's go out some style it's not a full book review, it's every 10 chapters I'll just be reviewing it's just a view, it's going to be in sections and it's going to take me a while to actually get through. Um, just the first 10 chapters was like a, oh my god, really? But anyway, let's start the blurb, okay? I know this is based on her ancestor. And um, here we go. Let me just, uh, here we go. Mm -hmm. To follow her heart, she must cross her cons continents. Continents, here you go. London, 1865. In ever to rebel against a society a woman are expected to conform, free-spirited Lady Margaret Montague Douglas, Scott. Leaves a social confines and an arranged marriage, but her parents, the Duke and Duchess of Belcleur, must face the public scrutiny of their daughter's impulsive nature, and Margaret is banished from polite society. Finding strength among her friends, including Queen Victoria's daughter, Princess Louise, Margaret embarks on a journey of self discovery that will take her to Ireland, America, and finally back to Britain, in search of the life she was always meant to lead and the love she was meant to find. Memorising the debut of Love and Daring from Sarah Ferguson, Duchess of York. Okay, oh, with Margarita, so Marguerite K. Okay, who is a very, very prolific Mills and Boone writer, so she has a ghost writer, it's not just her, she wrote it for someone else. Okay, let me just read the author. Okay, all right, mm -hmm. right. Sarah Ferguson, Duchess of York, is a best selling memorist and children's author. A Heart for a Compass is a first novel for adults. She's a daughter in law of Her Majesty the Queen, a former wife of. Prince, the second born son, Duke of York. Here you go. I know of people who say his actual name, okay, it kind of like a uh, lot of YouTube. So, daughter in law of Her Majesty the Queen, a former wife. Um, so, you're a former daughter in law, you're not married to him anymore. So, she's a daughter in law of Her Majesty the Queen. You're not anymore, you got divorced. Oh, and grandmother to um, August, and another baby on the way in the family. Okay, so. It starts out with, what's her name again? Lady Margaret Montague Douglas Scott. Here you go. Oh my God. Okay. Right. Now, it, it starts with chapter one, Montague House, London, Wednesday, 9th of July, 1865. Now, Montague House, I did look this up today. It was literally on the embankment, right opposite um, where the MI5 building is now. That's where the, the house was. So the house was real. Okay. Oh, this person was real. I don't think this life was real. Right. Lord Rufus Ponsby, the Earl of Killen, was considered to be the most presentable looking man. His tall Aveline figure was always immaculately dressed. His aquiline profile was suitably haughty, a benefit in the elder realm. Every aspect of him was a store of repressed and calculated. And of course, Lady Margaret Montague Douglas Scott, okay, she is just taking his tender step forward. I'm really aware of that. And he seems kind of displeased with her because this is the announcement of her betrothal. She's going to be married to Killen, okay? And she, I kind of, her attitude to this, I, I swear to God, I don't know what's going on through her head, but he appears before her. And have you, hey, have you guys seen um, Court's Bride, okay? You know that guy, you know, the one at Victoria, who was my Victoria, who killed Emily, okay? And, uh, you know, that's how he's described, standing there all haughty with a pocket watch, you know? He's, you know, with a refined chin. Mm -hmm. Right. That's that's how he's described. And she finds him repulsive. Okay. 
Right. Once a formal announcement was made, there'd be no going back. She would be engaged to, to, uh, to be married to a man she loathed and who she was utterly convinced didn't give a damn about her. No worse than that. The more time she spent in Killen's company, the more certain Margaret became that he actually disliked her. She tried to believe otherwise, but she was increasingly aware of his carefully disguised approval of, her every, of everything about her, from her manner to her weight. The fact that he managed to keep his feelings so well hidden from everyone else was another source of irritation. But her feelings, Margaret reminded herself, were quite irrelevant when it came to matchmaking. Killen was set on marrying her for his own ends, and her parents were even more determined that she marry him. She was able to make him ha make them all happy by doing her duty, which was understandably the correct course of action. So why her wretched instincts for choosing this highly inconvenient moment to rebel? Was she really going to marry this man? It seemed suddenly terrifying and impossible. So her attitude towards killing is, oh, I don't get it, okay? So he hasn't really engaged with her. Every time he speaks in, inside the market, he's being haughty and replies like, what does she expect him to do, ravish her? Okay, he's all haughty and that kind of stuff. And so, okay, she flees, she runs away. She's like, oh, oh, Killen, I just, I just kind of need some air. I just kind of, I need to go, okay. And she literally climbs down and escapes like, around the back, okay. And then she bumps into this guy here, okay. Right, right, cries with this guy, he's outside having a smoke, I like that. Right. She recognised the cultured Highland lid as belonging to Gut, uh, Donald Cameron of Lockley, an acquaintance of a father and some sort of diplomat. And he's like, oh, Lady Marker, what are you doing? And I swear to God right now, this is page nine. If this guy winds up being her one true love, I am going to be so pissed. Because why am I wasting my time reading 500 pages of a goddamn book if this guy's a one true love? Because I've read enough of these Mills and Boone books. This is a meat cute. This is a meat cute. Okay? Right. And her attitude is, oh, I'm just running away. I'm, well, no running away, okay. She's like, just popping out for, for smoke. That's what she says. Then she runs away into the night. Okay, but don't tell anyone that you saw me. Okay, right, so this is just the first chapter. And already, okay, she's impetuous and I don't know what she expects from the opposite sex, okay. The thing is, she's been around the marriage mark, you will. She's in opposite society, even though it's crappy, expects of her. Okay, it's kind of like I already unrolled my eyes and thinking someone's first world problem. She ran away from an arranged marriage, but okay. Uh, but then at chapter two, okay, right, it goes four months earlier to Windsor Castle, okay, and to Princess Louise, who was the fourth daughter of um, uh, Queen Victoria, who by this time is very, very deep in mourning, and sets up a scene okay, with Louise because essentially Princess Louise, okay. Kind of, I don't know if this is a dig over who her mother-in-law is, okay, or ex-mother-in-law, Sarah Ferguson. But this has a lot of digs already. I'm even page 13 to Queen Victoria, okay, um, for for her weight, for her mourning. The fact is, yes, actually, she did kind of treat her daughters as unpaid labour, okay. Right. There you go. Right. Not even a crumb. I have no attention to end up my mind for have a slice of this cake. Since Papa died, she has literally grown in stature, and she was never, not, never that he's sylph-like to begin with. Oh, come on, Lou. In her portrait, she has quite a lovely figure, said um, uh, Margaret. The queen in high is a multitude of sin. The queen has no dis discipline when it comes to the table. And then they talk about each other's weight, okay, and a marriage mark. And the fact is that Louise is so miserable in her life, okay, that the only thing she has within it okay is her artwork so and the fact is that louise is actually quite an unhappy figure this has actually been covered in other media as well i definitely know a little bit about this but um princess louise had a a life where i'm gonna spoil this now okay princess louise's life where she was kind of considered as her mother's unpaid help being like a social secretary or a secretary and um had finally broke through and got married but it wasn't a happy marriage sorry about that but hey it being a real life princess, and uh, I do actually watch documentaries. Right. There you go. The only freedom I have is to disappoint my mother on a daily basis, then under the same roof Margaret retorted. If it's not my hair, it's my freckles or my figure, or the way I enter a room. 
She said I burst like a London bobby, or the fact that I can't seem to retain my fan and never mind use it properly. There's no Louise that one could communicate um, using a fan. Well, that's, well, I did. Right. So, yeah, basically these two women just sit there and whinge about how, you know, their, their first world problems. And a lot of this book is done through a uh, kind of, for those who watch Bridgerton, okay, or Gossip Girl, Bridgerton did it first, um, society pages, okay, and gossip channels, okay, this one is the illustrated news. It's kind of like, that's our exponent, that's our exposition, okay. And then he's going back and forth, okay, in the narrative where Margaret is introduced to court. Now, I'll give the author, uh, Margarita Kay, mm -hmm, some respect that she's done the research on how it was done Victorian times being presented, how the kind of formal introduction, how it's done, okay, how you meet the Queen and, you know, you curtsy in a formal setting and you are introduced to society and then at the marriage mark actually begins, okay? Well, I'll give it some respect. Right, this bit here. Alright, mm -hmm. but the fact is, okay, that Margaret's not been out in society long when Lord Rupert Ponsbury comes comes a calling for her hand, and the fact is that in this chapter, that she this titan head breath of fresh Scotch air, as the press have called her, okay, her parents do like this kind of guessing game, like who who think what's your hair, hair? you think who it is, and here we go, right. They make a guess, okay, that it's Ponsbury the Earl of Killing, her father repeated. You'll be a countess, mistress of, of a castle set on the banks of Loch Tay. Of course, a bit run down, and neither your dowry to fix it up, and the killing title isn't prestigious as ours, but it's a venerable one. As far as the side of the bargain, well, it's called I will call serendipity. I say it's lots of sheep, he has woolen mills. In more ways than one, it'll be a marriage made in heaven. So what do you say? Include with a rare smile. Haven't your mother and I done well by you? Okay, so she's been set up by her parents, okay, and she doesn't like it, and she actually voices her disapproval, she actually says she doesn't like him, okay, and so, uh, but her parents insist that she's going to marry this guy, so her parents are assholes, and so they expect her to be obedient and placid, and this titan head, breath of scotch air that's come down from, obviously, the Highlands, she's not having it. Now, I actually like, okay, this side of Margaret. But the fact is, okay, that she, well, obviously, she's, you know, she's submissive in her way. Okay, she, she yields to them. She she actually agrees, okay, to, to do it. And then she changed her mind. I thought this is flashing back to flashes back and forth. This flashes back and forth within the narrative, okay, until it kind of, kind of catch up, sorry, catches up to itself. So Margaret runs, 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 okay, she runs to the docks and mm -hmm, come to terms, okay, but the fact is that she may have made the most stupid mistake of her life and she, oh, that's this bit here, okay, right, this bit here. this is when, okay, she kind of rationalised her parents' um, actions. We'll be having back in the ballroom with Mama and Papa still be there standing on the dais with their confusion resigned. Or had her person returned to report her flight, causing them to send all their guests home. They would be utterly furious with her. If they didn't listen to her, no, that wasn't fair. She had not tried nearly forcefully enough to make herself heard. She had been too eager to please, ignoring what her instincts had been turned off from the first. They think her action is childish, selfish, faultless, and dignified. Right. They were unaware of her ongoing debate as she had been having with herself at the moment the match had been proposed. So her fight was seen like a bolt from the blue. She didn't voice her opinions fast enough. She's kind of trying to justify their actions, of which they what, forced her into this. However, as, as maybe salvation... Now, remember, she is in the Docklands, okay, wearing a ball gown, okay, wearing a white... I don't know, so she's wearing blue. Wearing a ball gown, okay. And, obviously, the docks are a dangerous place no matter what you are what you are and she's wearing a ball gown but salvation comes and mr scott a fellow highlander okay he's off both his legs in the crime mirror and they sit down and have a chat okay so she sits there and she essentially says okay um i walked away from my betrothal to my future husband who owns a castle to a man who lost his legs in the crime mirror who can't walk 
um, obviously, and can't read, and they have a little chat, but she just confides in him, they can find each other's stories as well, but she does it sitting cross-legged on the ground as well, and, but she, um, she unburdens to him, and I'm like, okay, yeah, I think you guys are quite uncommon, okay, all right, but the thing is, luckily, okay, all right, the Donald, Catches up with her, pulls her from the ground, says, "What are you doing?" And takes her home, and says, "What?" She's like, "Well, I was telling him my life story." And uh, in the melee, this kid brace has gone missing, and his attitude is, is this, okay, right, mm -hmm. right, right. You'll be even more right. You can find it in a complete stranger. That's Mister Scott, and even more astonished, she actually listened. She retorted. You were pleased to know he agreed with you, Lockley, that I should not have been humiliated. I should not have humiliated killing. He didn't try to persuade me to marry him. Was he meant to ravish you, my Lady Margaret? Okay. Right. And well, Donald actually agrees with her that, you know, he's humorless and he's too ambitious and that kind of stuff. And the fact is that one thing I did actually like prior to this is that Mr. Scott actually says, well, you, you didn't make your attention clear to this guy that you didn't want to marry him. You just humiliated him. That's not fair either. I actually like that. I like that. I mean, up to this point, we are seeing Killen, from Margaret's point of view, of being, you know, a bore, an oaf. Um, I don't want to marry him. He's too ambitious. But when someone turns around again and says, hold on, you just treated this guy shamefully. He has not wronged you. It's an arranged marriage, but in your culture, that's the norm. And maybe you just grow to love each other. Hey, hey, good writing by Marguerite K. Right. So, but because of her actions, Margaret is banished. She is banished from her family for Christmas. She's going to spend Christmas in Scotland all alone with her, with her servants. And she is utterly, utterly miserable. They banish her. She's banished, okay? And she just walks around for several months, okay, just feeling sorry for herself. And I... <laughs> okay. Right, it's there. Right, and the thing is, okay, it's done once again through letters, okay. Um, Louise is like, well, good for you. Um, uh, this, it's a scandal. Her mum's like, you're not coming back. And uh, Donald's like, oh yeah, thank you, bracelet. Okay, so Mr. Scott had it. He's a good guy after all. Okay, so hey, th thank you, Mr. Scott. So, and for this Louise, okay, it's like, you're funny, get over this, they'll be fine, okay. Right, but the weeds have been wrong for once. I found her perfectly capable of leaving her all alone at Dark Heath today of all days. This is Christmas Day. The more she attended church with the rest of the household, sitting alone in her family's pew for the Christmas service, felt horribly exposed by, is by her isolation. Too bad she joined the hymns with her usual youth enthusiasm. After church, when she when Mum was usually handing out her gifts to the village children, she'd asked Miss Mack to act in her steed this year. The housekeeper had been clearly uncomfortable performing the task, a snub to Margaret too painfully obvious to be ignored. So much that uh, Margaret had denied herself her annual treat of watching the children unwrap the wooden toys and buy sugar treats, or turn on one of her stories, she'd written a story for Mary as usual, her, her semis, and said it to Drum Loig as a family home. But she doubted her sister would ever be permitted to noise the gift, even if she received it. So she's so feeling sorry for herself. That tradition's okay. She's forcing her to the servants. You've got the most stuff to do. But the servants aren't they're not pretty chill about it. They're like, well, spend Christmas with us. You're not going to be alone. Don't die alone. Spend it with us. And she's walking along. And one thing I did, I did, okay, like about this book is the fact is that Margaret is coming to the realisation of how her choice may kind of mess all this up, okay? And mess it up for her. Because being 1865... Being a woman with a dowry, but a woman who, you know, obviously can't vote, her husband owns that owns her while she's married. Her father owns her, her husband owns her. She can't even have custody of her own children on the event of a divorce, okay? She knows what her future will look like in case things don't change for her, okay? Right. A maiden aunt at the beck and call of her brother and sisters and their offsprings, trying to repeat the post as required. She was a perpetual guest in others' home, expecting to be nothing but dutiful and grateful to the end of her days. Because she played a part of the role expected of her, as Rufus Ponsby's wife. She could never love him, but love wasn't part of the bargain. You must resist the urge to let your heart steal your actions, Louise's words had stung, but she was right. Margaret should be asking herself whether she could learn to respect him, to hold him with some sort of affection. Every instinct screamed a resounding no, but look where instincts had landed her. 
So she prepared over six months to kind of realise in the fact what has happened to go back and become his killing bride, and maybe they can work at it. Maybe she can she, she can be that. Okay. Right. And when she go find and the thing is why she's sitting in Scotland feeling sorry for herself when she does finally reunite with her family in London, they actually make it clear how much her presence was missed. Okay. Right. Right. Do you have any idea, this is from her mother when she goes back, okay? Do you have any idea how difficult it was for us to continue with the celebrations as normal? Some of your cousins look forward to the occasion all year long, you know. Little family traditions and ceremonies mean a great deal to us, including her. And yet she was screwed and forced to spend a, sol a solitary miserable Christmas alone at Dargu. But she was resolved not to look back, only forward. How can we repair the damage done, Mama? Whatever it takes, I'll promise to do my utmost. Okay. So she's going back to her mum, okay, but basically apologises, throws herself at the altar. Her mum's like, even though you weren't there, you ruined Christmas, okay? Like, right, they screwed with her. And she's like, well, I'm going to marry Darkeith. Sorry, I'm marry Darkeith. I'm going to marry Killen, sorry. Once I was in Darkeith, I made the decision to marry Killen. Uh, but it turns out that this has now been spread within the society papers. No names given, as it wasn't back then, but dropping hints, okay, to this perfect Scotch air. And her actions hang around the Vala docks, okay? Mm -hmm. And they're trying to do their best to restore her reputation, okay? To restore her in the eyes of hopefully a killer and will take her back. I think that's the plan. And this bit here, okay? All right. You're now fully restored to health because they told everyone that she's been ill. The first, most immediate priority is to put an end to any speculation that your innocence has been compromised. Therefore, we need to show you off in public. There are not many opportunities until the season starts, but we will accept every invitation, and I'll make a point of hosting a soiree, a soiree myself. It'll be naturally to focus your attention. Stand up and let me take a look at you. And uh, also, um, lose a couple of pounds once you're here, you know, because you've put on some weight. Because people are very obsessed with Margaret's weight. Okay? Right. But the thing is, six weeks later, okay, once you've also got a bracelet back from... Um, uh, Donald, well, Donald gave it to her, she gave it to her mama, so the thing's broken, it wasn't lost after all, so he's, he's, he's covered for that. She's going down to, um, going down to meet up with Donald, who's kind of been an ally for this, he's been a friend, okay, and as a male chaperone to a female chaperone, is stepping out in town, quite scandalous. And she's dressed plain. She's dressed plain and she is going to um, kind of go into the kind of underworld of London, if you will. Now, this is a woman who has spent six months in isolation, okay, which a lot of us um, know what that's like, due to the her actions, she, bringing shame onto her family and she ruined Christmas. And now Katie prepared to do it all over again six weeks later in London. She could be spotted at any time stepping out of a man who's not courting her. As far as they know. Okay. Right, here you go. And the fact is, okay, she's trying to dress poor, but this bit here, okay? Right. I meant to ask, she says to Donald, is my outfit suitable? Should it be nondescript? I'm wearing my plainest bonnet and cloak. That bonnet alone would be worth a week's wage in a second hand clothing emporium. It is known as a slop shop, she informed him, looking smug. I learned that from Mr. Mayhew's book, but it was Mr. Scott who taught him my first can't words. Uh, good night for the young pickpocket, you know. I did not, but tell your mind to keep, to keep our wits about us. So she's going to go down to the underclass, if you will, to find Mr. Scott's wife, because Mr. Scott, who she met, who she sat with and told and burdened her soul, has a wife and three kids. The um, accident in the crime mirror took his legs, not his ability to um, become a parent. Chris Scott. And so she's going down to find his wife, okay? And to kind of help out, probably because uh, speculating here because he said he can't read and trying to get a pension, that kind of stuff. So that's what I'm going with, probably in the next from chap next chapter onwards. But the first ten chapters, a lot to like. It's very, very, very well researched. I will give it that as a Londoner. So I like the feeling of London, the sense of London. Um, I find that Lady Margaret. I understand where she's coming from, but I also find that a little bit annoying. The fact is that she doesn't speak up. And she seems kind of brattish in her outlook as well. Okay, it's all about me. 
And the sad thing is, you know, her instinct was to run away, but the problem is, is that she's from a society where from the earliest age, women are taught to act a certain way. And if you go against that, you know, you know the outcome already in advance. And she knew what would happen to her family and to her. She ran away, but she did it anyway. And she breaks herself for not speaking up. So she's kind of like a victim of whatever way of making by not speaking up. But at the same time, okay, she can't speak up, if you will. So it's kind of conflicting. So, and also the often mentions to the red hair, which Sarah Ferguson has, and the weight. Now, one thing I do know is the press were absolutely brutal to Sarah Ferguson regarding her weight. Um, she was too big. She was called the Duchess of Pork. Um, which is horrendous, by the way. Um, she was absolutely fat shamed by me. The media in my country absolutely brutal, especially to royals. So she was condemned quite a bit for her actions. She wasn't, you know, she was loud, she was brash, she was abrasive. And I can see a bit of a self insert here with the author herself to the actual character who she's related to. So, anyway, next section coming soon, obviously. Okay, this is a first 10 chapter review. Let's see what happens next, because to be honest, okay, never really feels much has happened yet. I mean, Margaret feels a lot of time kind of feeling sorry for herself. Anyway, sign up, take care. Bye now.